You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. Hold on to your seat. Wow! These Micro Machines are bigger. They're new Star Wars action fleet vehicles from Micro Machines. All action-sized. For more Luke Skywalker action. X-Wing, X-Mode. More Darth Vader action. It's an air attack. There to the max. Vader, Lord Vader. The Star Wars action fleet with Rebel and Imperial forces all ready for battle. New action size for Star Wars adventures straight from the movies. New Micro Machines Star Wars action fleet vehicles with two action figures each sold separately. New from Galoob. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to GeekFest Rants. My name is Carlos Perone, and today we are once again taking the route towards Star Wars toys. Two different products we're going to be looking at today. First off is concept vehicles. Not just the art, as we've examined and looked at it many, many times before from some of the highly acclaimed conceptual designers and artists, you know, in the Star Wars universe, but we are going to look at actual toys or three-dimensional representations, if you will, of a lot of this concept art through different phases of the toy side where Hasbro at one point designs a couple of these concept vehicles and Hot Wheels at a certain point also, you know, takes a shot at that. We've had in the past discussed briefly a couple of concept ships that were made you know for the three and three quarter inch scale line this, this is back you know on the power of the force days where i guess it was in the mid 90s when they were pumping out uh, you know new star wars merchandise you know after the dark times but these were larger these were very large ships that you could actually fit an action figure into what we're looking at this time around is ships that are a little smaller and they kind of go back also way, way back into the original designs and the original concept drawings and them being recreated. We're following a couple of waves, again, some of them from the 90s, early 2000s, if you will, and some of them very, very current within the last year. So that is what we're going to do on our first part of the show. Then on the second part of the show, we are going to hit an old toy that... I barely knew it existed. It was out there in the periphery of Star Wars. It was during a period of Kenner where they were releasing just about anything they can get their hands on and repurposing a lot of toys from earlier lines from other licensees just to be able to put something out there. And uh, what I'm talking about here is the Star Wars movie viewer. I guess you can call it an, a super early version of home video, if you will. And we're going to we're gonna kind of dive deep into that one. And it's, it's an amazing uh, little find that I was able to get my hands on. And I'll give you as much information as possible about it. And you never know, maybe you'll be interested in getting one one day. Anyway, let's get started with Star Wars Concept Ships. You can collect them all! You are a toy! Batteries not included. Just get those wonderful toys. Details on specially marked packages at participating stores. Is that the $6 million man's boss? It's Oscar Goldman. Why do you have that? That's worth a lot of money. That's much more valuable than Steve Austin. Action figures each sold separately. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. Some assembly required. All your favorite Star Wars heroes and villains. I have three of each, one to display, one to open, and one just in case. All right, I like to approach a different kind of collectible today. It's still in the Star Wars family because a lot of my stuff is in the Star Wars family here. This specific one comes from somewhere in the late 90s, around the time of The Phantom Menace. Technically, it's Hasbro. It's under the banner of Galoob. Back then, if you guys remember, Galoob was big into Micro Machines. And they had created an entire world of Micro Machine, Star Wars, Star Trek, all types of different movie lines. And there was a whole world of those. But 
they tried to kind of cross a little bit by making slightly larger ships. And, and those kind of went on for a for pretty long time. They, they created quite a number of them. And I'm talking about, you know, if your average micro machine is about two inches long, they at one point created something that was about five or six inches long. And, you know, they had relative success with a lot of that stuff. But sometime, again, sometime around the late 90s, early 2000s, let's say, they created something called Series Alpha. And what this was, was basically kind of like a two-pack. A box came with two ships. The more five to six inch version of, let's say, for example, an X-Wing, the one that we all know and very familiar with you know, in those dimensions and those colors, but also a smaller version of it labeled as a concept model. And the whole point of this package was to show you the concept design or the prototype version of the vehicle based on some artist's idea and then the finished product underneath. So you could kind of say that in a way it, it was it was a manner of kind of repackaging, if you will, something that already existed by adding something else to it. And there you go. There it is. It's out there. Now, I'm not entirely sure if some of these were exclusively made. I'm talking about the large size version ones for this two pack, this special series alpha version. Or if, yeah, they just, did re they just did a lot of repackaging at one point. It's possible. Who knows? Who cares? The point is that these were released and were out there. And initially, I really had no interest whatsoever in these. The smaller prototype one also came with a tiny little, I don't know if it was a booklet or a little piece of paper that had information on some of the conceptual drawings, let's say, or who did it or the, the, the artist or that sort of thing. But the larger one, the one that came below it or right next to it, depending on, on the packaging, also had a couple of little tiny uh, micro-machine size or galoob size figures, because the little figures could fit inside the ship. Again, not exactly proportional, but good enough. You know, if you had an X-Wing that was a droid, you could stick, you know, the little R2 droid, you could stick him into the, into the droid socket in the X-Wing. And the pilot, which Luke, I assume, or a generic rebel pilot, could fit in the cockpit. You can, you know, close the cockpit and it would, it would work. Now, what was cool about the minifigures also was that it usually came with two of them, and it had a final design figure and then a concept figure. They actually did take the time to try to sculpt, I guess, uh, uh, the secondary figure to be associated with whatever the concept vehicle there was. Sometimes there was art that they could use, you know, for the conceptual uh, drawing of who the pilot of this particular vehicle would be. And sometimes I think they just made it up because they really didn't have that much to go on. But a few of them, you actually do see uh, how the figure is based on a concept drawing. So that's kind of neat. So these came with a special display base that makes them, again, makes them different than the regular display bases because it actually had two prawns that you could actually mount both of them next to each other so you could look at the comparison. But again, going back, I never really was into this for some reason. You know, I, I, it never clicked with me. Not until I started looking heavily, heavily into the conceptual drawing side of Star Wars, which I kind of dabbled with it a little bit, you know, obviously following all the Macquarie stuff. And then little by little, I started branching out into other artists, Joe Johnston, uh, Nilo Rowe, I can never pronounce his name, <laughs> <laughs> Colin Cantwell more recently, you know, another name that popped out there. All of a sudden he became, you know, uh, he, he came out there and he was all of a sudden making the convention rounds and selling prints and this and that. And most recently, you know, uh, around the same time as Cantwell uh, started kind of coming out and, and doing stuff, they released a, a couple of his ships by Hot Wheels, completely different brand, but in sort of proportion to the ones that I'm talking about here, alongside a Hasbro one that was released as part of the Solo movie, an Imperial ship that was his conceptual design, which, which we'll talk about later. But let's start with these because these are the ones that kind of started me, you know, interested in trying to collect a three-dimensional, if you will, rendition of some of these concept drawings. Now, again, you have to go back to the concept drawings and you got to dig through your Macquarie's and your, especially your Macquarie's and your Joe Johnson's to get a, a good look at what I'm talking about here when it comes to these series alpha ones. 
Let's start, for example, with the snow speeder. The snow speeder we know now started out, again, different many incarnations, but for this particular one, they, they chose one that was very, very interesting looking, the design. It almost looks like the cockpit of the Y-Wing in a way. It's a very slightly triangular with two guns at either end. Uh, you can kind of see where this is the beginning, in a way, of that design. It's a very short, flat, two-person vehicle. Looks like you could fit two people in there. Very bare-bones design. But again, for a three-dimensional rendition of a drawing, this looks really, really cool. Really, really nice. The Adat. The Adat, uh, again, all of these vehicles, like I mentioned earlier, come in package with the, the before and the after. The conceptual and then the final version. This particular version of the Adat, it's funny because it is an earlier version. It is a little more detailed, more structured, if you will, textured all over its hull. It does have what appears to possibly be some kind of a gun port or some kind of a mechanism on its belly, as if it could shoot from under its belly. It does have a similar looking head as the final one, but I do think I remember seeing a concept a drawing of this particular one in a Joe Johnston design. It is very, very close to the final design. I believe it's uh, the final design is supposed to be a lot taller. This was, you know, they were almost getting there. They were getting very close. And this is very close, but it's a, again, it's a three dimensional representation. So it looks really, really good. And then I have here a X Wing. Now, the X Wing, it's funny because the X Wing looks a lot, a lot, and I'm going to say a lot like the X-Wing that we ended up with at the end. The engines are a little different. The color is very different. It's uh, more of a steel color. And I would say that its designation, at least according to these drawings, it's either a very dark blue or a gray. I think it, it leans more towards a gray. And it does have some yellow stripes uh, running along its edge. The cockpit is completely different. It's completely blacked out. But overall, it looks a lot like the, the final product. This is one of the ones that, out of all of them, looks almost the most like the final product. It's not that different, let's put it that way. Then I have a, what is supposed to be the Shuttle Tidarium concept model. And I have seen pictures like this, and again, I cannot really pinpoint it whether it's Johnston or McQuarrie. But you do have the triangular wings, the, the three-wing formation that appears to also, not in this particular model, but it looks like fun from, a, from a functional perspective the wings do fold up like they did on the final product on the final version of it but what's interesting about this particular design is that the entire cockpit the entire cargo area and cockpit of the ship is not like the final product the final product is more of a um let's say kind of like slightly triangular slightly rectangular pointing down nose and then from underneath, the ramp opens and people get in and out. This one, is it's as if they completely removed the cockpit area and they replaced it with a metallic glass bubble that kind of sinks into the wings. So you end up with a three-gun port on the tip of each wing on the inside, not the outside, not, not at the tippy, not at the edge of the wing, but close to the cockpit area. And it's interesting because this design, I believe later on, it could have been Revenge of the Sith. It could have been uh, the Clone Wars animated series. It could have been one of those after films that I believe it was later used. Later on, they did create this kind of a ship. The, the similar wing structure with the bubble cockpit. You know, Lucasfilm uh, and, and these films are notorious for recycling all concepts that were not used in a film and then using them later. They, they love to do that. And, and I mean... Again, fans of, of Macquarie and Johnston and that sort of thing, uh, you know, we love to see that sort of thing. We love to see concept stuff being recycled and used in a different way later on. The ad that we just talked about, same thing. I believe we got to see a version of this ad at more or less in, I think it might have been either in Rebels or Clone Wars. Again, I forget. Where the one, there's one with all the clones that are living out in the desert or something. And we got... Uh, uh, well, they were on top of a different vehicle, but I'm pretty sure I've seen a variation of this somewhere. I'm not entirely sure right now. The snow speeder, I, I don't remember re seeing that again somewhere else. Again, it's it's a very small ship, so it's hard to say. The other one I own from that series 
is the Bespin cloud car. Now, as you remember, the Bespin cloud car is the twin pod car, the, t the equally round, orange, bubbly kind of uh, structures that carry those Bespin security guards around. Well, the early concept model, uh, that might, again, might have been uh, Macquarie or Johnson, I'm not sure. To me, it reminds me more of a classical Flash Gordon design. And it would make sense because the style that Macquarie went after when it comes to designing Cloud City uh, was a very traditional Flash Gordon-y, Art Deco, rounded edges, lots of curves uh, design. Well, this ship looks very much like something that could fit in a Flash Gordon film. It's a very rockety kind of capsule, but it has two cockpits built, you know, next to each other on the same ship. Even though they're separate cockpits, left and right, they're not as spaced apart as the final product. The twin pod car looks almost like two separate ships that got kind of glued together. This one, no, this one looks like one ship with two cockpits. Interesting, very interesting design, how different it looks. And it's funny because you can almost extrapolate those two twin pod cars from those cockpits and, and you can you could visually remove just those two sections and say, I just want these two sections to be the final product, discard everything else. And it, it works really well that way. So that's another uh, great example of, of this uh, sort of concept vehicle. Now, the line had more, and I don't own any more from that line. I've been looking for them, but they're very, they're kind of expensive the, the deeper you go into the line. My main focus with that particular line was the original trilogy because the phantom menace had just come out uh, they were also selling phantom menace concept vehicle sets now i believe this did not get past the phantom menace because when i look all over the internet i cannot find any concept vehicles produced under that banner that would fall under Attack of the Clones or Revenge of the Sith. So they kind of put the kibosh on that early on. As a matter of fact, this was probably... There's a good possibility that some of this might have been released even before the movie came out, The Phantom Menace, because the movie came out in 99, I believe. And one of the reasons why it's it possible that it, that it did go that way is because the packaging for the Phantom Menace-inspired ships is labeled as Star Wars Episode One. So it is conceivable that some, if not all, of these vehicles uh, were put out even before the movie's name was announced. The final name, you know, the final, final name of the movie. Uh, it's possible, because why would you just put episode one? I remember the episode one logo was used for quite a while because they were still trying to uh, keep everything hush-hush. You know, they were releasing information a little bit at a time, you know, in drips and drabs. And uh, the copyright on the bottom of one of these... Uh, the Sith Infiltrator is listed as uh, copyright 1999. So it does make sense because the movie did come out in 99. So I, again, I, I cannot really tell how early did they really put these out. So yeah, it's possible. It's possible that they did that. But anyway, as I was saying before, there's a number of these that I, I never had uh, that I'm still looking for. Specifically, I'm looking for right now the B-Wing. There is a version of the B-Wing out there that to me it looks pretty close to the final product the deployment of the extra wings you know the 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 triangular t-shape deployment seems to be a little different i don't remember too much i would have to really dig into the conceptual drawings but what looks really interesting about the the concept is that you have the traditional cockpit you know at one end and instead of having just a gun at the bottom it looks like it has another cockpit at the bottom with a gun. The middle, unfortunately, I cannot tell how it functions. I can't tell the deployment of that wing or if it even deploys. I don't know. There is a, um, a piece of art that comes with it, and it's really kind of hard to tell. It looks to me almost like a Joe Johnston design because it's that blue ink. And I really can't tell exactly how elaborate the deployment of the wings, if it even exists you know, on the concept version of that. So that's the B-Wing. Then the other one that I would be, uh, that I'm still looking for is the Y-Wing. Again, the Y-Wing, a more traditional classic ship 
What I really like about the Y-Wing is that at least in its cockpit section, it seems to mimic more, again, the traditional Macquarie style. The secondary cockpit that it was supposed to have in the place where the gun is on top of the cockpit, you would have a secondary, I guess, a gunner up there. But that was, again, it was removed, I remember, in the conceptual... It didn't get past the conceptual stage because to create that kind of a, a bubble cockpit would have been way too difficult for the blue screen process to have a transparent cockpit that would just bleed out. If you can't hide the glass within metal against a blue screen background that would then have to, you know, uh, attach stars to it. it. It traditionally, back then, back then, I'm talking about back then, the optical printing process would have just washed out and, and bled out the entire cockpit uh, because it would be unprotected. So yeah, that's one of the reasons why they did it. It also looks very metal, very steel, chrome, uh, you know, kind of uh, a finish to it. The rest of the body looks pretty much in proportion, but yeah, they, there is a little less detail. The, the majority of the difference I see on the cockpit. Now, what's also interesting here is that if you look at the little art book that accompanies this particular toy, they do credit Colin Cantwell as the artist of this, even though it is very much Ralph McQuarrie concept. However, this is one of those, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? I know that McQuarrie did a very detailed drawing, a painting actually, of the Y-Wing in its hangar. But I know that Cantwell also did some actual kit bash models of it. So in a way, this could be considered a Cantwell one. But again, this goes back and forth with a lot of these artists where one artist will start it, another artist will add to it, and then he'll go back to that other artist and they kind of go back and forth and play off each other, you know, into what the final outcome becomes. You know, it is really difficult to really claim one final model, you know, to one person a lot of times because they do collaborate a lot of times. They did collaborate a lot of times on the final design. However, I guess it all depends on which piece of art they are using for creating this particular model. So that's it for the original ships from the original trilogy. Now, as I said before, because of the episode one selling aspect that they're trying to uh, develop here, they did introduce a whole bunch of episode one ships. Now, these are the hardest to find. And everywhere I look, first of all, you never see them. You almost never see them loose. They're always boxed and they're super expensive, at least for my, you know, what I'm looking to spend on these things. But let's go through a few of them. There is the droid fighter. If you guys remember the droid fighters, the ones that fly around, um, that sort of thing. There is a conceptual droid fighter that looks absolutely nothing like it. Now, I'm not sure exactly who is credited uh, for the conceptual drawings, because again, I never owned these, but from what I remember, some of the conceptual designer was Doug Chang. He might have had other people around them, but uh, that's the name that I seem to remember the most about the Phantom Menace. This version of the droid fighter is, is really odd looking, nothing, absolutely nothing like what we remember the final product looks like. The final product is a weird looking droid fighter. It's a droid fighter. The droid is built into the fighter. It's one unit. It has two, you know, two sides that shoot from the sides. And I think at one point you could even see those sides bend and they can actually walk in a hangar on the tippy toes of their wings. Really odd design. But the conceptual one is less circular, I would say UFO-ish kind of thing with a big engine in the middle, two guns in the front, and what appears to be two cockpits on either side of this circular vehicle. You could not be any further away <laughs> from a design of a vehicle than this. It's red. It is like uh, kind of like a brick red, almost orange kind of design. And we are going to come back to this because the only thing close to this is another one that I will talk about later. That is just unusual how they went in that direction and then they switched it, you know. It's, it's really weird. Next up, you have the Naboo Fighter. The only thing that's similar about the Naboo fighter is the color scheme <laughs> from what we get and the final end of the movie. The final end of the movie, you know, by the time we get to the movie, the Naboo fighter is a, a very slick chrome and yellow, almost kind of T-shaped, and it flies in reverse in a way that you would expect it to, as opposed to pointing towards where you're going. It's the other way around. It kind of trails behind itself of that T-shape. Well, the concept version of that looks a lot to me a lot like 
Anakin's pod racer, and then later on in Attack of the Clones, the Coruscant speeders that we see zipping about, it has more of that feel to it. It doesn't have that T-shape at all. It's a more traditional fighter speedery kind of design, a slightly oval shape with two huge engines, which it's funny because they kind of retained those engines. They just kind of separated them and formed this T-shaped design, and they got away from the traditional you know, oval shape of a speeder, if you will, of, of a Coruscant flying speeder. But it's really, really interesting. You can see bits and pieces of it, and you can see how somebody, obviously George Lucas probably said, all right, I want you to keep these engines, I want you to streamline the back, I like the color scheme, you know, you could kind of feel that from just from the from the concept alone. That's a, that's a really nice one. Up next, we have the Royal Starship. Again, from Naboo, it's the Royal Ship. This is the ship that, that very chrome silvery ship that they escape on and they land and they're looking for parts and that sort of thing. Well, what is most unusual about this particular package is that the concept ship is the larger of the two. It appears to be the larger of the two. And it is it is so much different in terms of it does have that full chrome look, a very sleek, long shape ship. But the final product became more of a what I would consider to be the opposite of the Naboo Starfighter. The Naboo Starfighter, remember I said it, it, it flies backwards. It's a T-shaped fighter that f- flies towards the, the, the head of the T. Well, this one is a somewhat T-shaped ship, if you remember it, that flies forward. With the concept vehicle, it is just completely unusually different. It still has that long look to it. It does also have, if I am not looking at it the wrong way, a color variation, which is a blue kind of stripe running through the top and maybe a possible black. It's hard to say, it's hard to tell the difference between a black black color and a chrome that's uh, reflecting black, but it definitely has a blue streak. And it it is just uh, different. It it, It is a little fatter. It is a little more almost cylindrical, if you will. It is very, very odd how they slimmed it down. It almost looks like a yacht in a way. <laughs> it is. It has parts that are just unusually different. But again, you can just like the other one, you can tell where somebody said, all right, I like those engines. I like the long nose. Let's make it all silver. Let's make it all chrome. Let's And let's get pointier and pointier as you get to the tip of it. It has like this little spoilery, weird looking thing on the side, but it appears to only have it on one side. I don't know. I, I don't understand that, that the functionality of that. Let's get rid of that. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's a really unusual design. I'm, I'm, I'm very surprised. I've never looked at it in this much detail and realized what a difference. And the fact, again, that the the final concept is the smaller of the two. That's That's really, really odd. All right, next up, we have the Sith Infiltrator. Again, this is the ship that we only see a little bit of. Darth Maul arriving in Tatooine. It has those uh, Darth Vader, TIE Fighter, uh, crooked kind of wings and a very long snout. Well, it's funny because the concept model, (laughs) the concept version of it completely does not have those kind of wings. It has what I would consider to be more traditional Nemodian looking structures but in the middle cockpit is it's a circular cockpit like a tie fighter almost and it looks at two, and it has those wing attachments instead of the traditional tie fighter wings it, it, again it, it uses a completely different one it's black and and a little bit of gray and it has red you know again it kind of follows the motif of the Darth Maul look but at some point they went completely a different direction. Here's another situation where the concept vehicle is the bigger of the two. And I'm and I might be detecting a slight pattern here, maybe I'm not entirely sure, but it's possible that since the micro machine line was still in effect, a lot of the final concept vehicles uh, were produced in micro machine size. So that would explain what maybe they didn't want to produce a secondary size of the same vehicle when they already had it in, in the final product. You know, when they were going to sell these micro machines on three packs or even bigger, you know, it's already there. So let's just reverse it. Let's just make the big one, uh, the concept one. And we already, and we, you know, we don't have to tinker with the other one because traditionally they would have had to tinker and redo the original ship or the final ship and then produce a concept one on top of it. So this way they could save some money and the other one is already pre-made. So that would kind of explain the difference in size as to why they decided to go this way. 
The other ones was different because the other ones they already hadn't produced, so they were doing the reverse. They were repackaging something that possibly already existed. And that, I think, would basically wraps up the, the Alpha series version of these ships. As I mentioned before, they didn't go beyond this. They kind of put the kibosh on it at some point. I guess they realized they weren't making enough money. There's no point in moving into the Attack of the Clones phase or the Revenge of the Sith phase. But that was the end of it. And at that point, that's where I had stopped collecting these altogether. However, something happened. About a year ago, I think it is, uh, we started hearing the rumblings of Solo, the standalone film that was about to come out, that there might be a ship that we might recognize. And that was also around the time, I said, where Colin Cantwell was becoming a little more um, out in the open and, and doing the convention circuits and, and doing autographs and showing everybody his art and his concept designs and pictures and some of his models and that kind of thing, giving out, you know, giving interviews. Well, they announced a ship that was going to come out as part of the Hasbro small ship line, which used to be called the Titaniums, I think. I don't even know if they're even called that anymore. But they put out a ship that was supposed to be an Imperial, kind of like a, I don't know if you want to call it a spy ship or a, a warship or something. Looked a little bit like a Star Destroyer, but different. And it was very much exactly like a Colin Cantwell design. This is back when he was just kit bashing his brains out. This is when Star Wars was being developed. You have some McQuarrie stuff already in the ether. You have Cantwell stuff in the ether. And he's out there just kit bashing like crazy, putting together things that kind of look like something. Well, one of the original designs for the Star Destroyer, there were a couple, is pretty much like a little bit like what we know now of the death of a Star Destroyer. That is a, a triangular-ish, long, flat surface. But this particular one had a bridge, if you will, at the end, kind of like a Star Destroyer. But it also had these huge radar dishes on either side and one in the front. And I think there were supposed to be more uh, weapons, not radar dishes, but they look like radar dishes. Well, that design, like I said, they revived it for Solo. They used it in a very, very short scene in the background. You blink and you miss it. It's actually a hologram of a commercial, you know, for the for the military, if you will. And it kind of came and went real fast. But for people that are into these concept ships, it's like, wow, they're actually going to make it. So, you know, I, originally we all thought that the, the ship was going to play a, a, a bigger role in the film. But no, it was just a kind of like a background kind of thing. And then they announced that Hot Wheels, as part of their... Star Wars concept line, which, again, I don't remember seeing too much concept, but it's a new line, again, specifically having to do with the Colin Cantwell art and the Colin Cantwell designs based on his models, his Kit Bash models. We're going to put out five ships this year. And little by little, I've been collecting them, and it took me a while because the, the first three were moderately simple to find, if you will, moderately. <laughs> I had to go to a GameStop store nearby and I was able to get the first three. So I was able to get the X-Wing, the Millennium Falcon, and the TIE Fighter. Now let's talk about them first, because there's two more. The X-Wing, again, looks very different. Even than the, the, this one from the Alpha series, it looks very different. The X-Wing is the original X-Wing, which is actually shaped like an X. And I told the story before, the reason why that original concept, according to Cantwell, changed is because the mechanism jammed and they could not get the mechanism to fully form the X. When you think of the letter X, a symmetrical X, like a plus sign almost, tilted. That is what the original design of the model was supposed to imitate. But according to, again, legend, if you will, myth, urban legend, <laughs> it's what Cantwell says that, well, when they did that, when they had the, the ship go from flat to the X position, it stopped at a certain point. It would not fully X out. And after, I guess, looking at it a couple of times, they realized, oh, that, that looks actually better. You know, not to do the full X, to kind of do that, that half X, the soft X, if you will, uh, which is the final position that we're now more familiar with of the deployment of the wings, you know, for the X-Wing, for, for the battle formation, if you will. Also, the nose is a lot shorter in this one. And and not only shorter, but it's uh, it, to me it feels like it's a lot skinnier, especially skinnier than the rest of the wings in, in proportion to the wings. You know, again, we're comparing what we're used to seeing with the early concept design. So, yes, that is a great piece because it is so different and it's so truthful. To its original intent that it's, it's a it's a really good one to have the tie fighter 
uh, looks more like a traditional TIE fighter, except that the coloring is different. The wings are almost all black. The cockpit is gray. They replicate a lot of the little details that they put on the wings, that he put on the wings as part of the kit bash process. There's a lot more texture, again, to those wings, even though they're the same shape. And I, I remember that even on the earlier pictures that we were able to see of those models, of those kit bash models, even the struts that are holding, attaching to the wings, the connections, they're a lot skinnier than they were eventually end up being. But the TIE fighter looks pretty good, pretty, pretty faithful, I think. The cockpit is a lot less detailed. Ironically, since the, you know, the wings are more detailed, but the cockpit is less detailed. It's more of a smooth surface with a black glass. And I think part of, uh, of the design here is that they didn't want to go for clear glass because that imply, you know, that gives you a, a problem because then you have to create an insight if you want to look into it. So a lot of the sections here where you have glass, uh, they just opted for the black finish. So it's kind of like non-reflective black. Uh, but it's also reflective of its original design. You know, they weren't that further along into it, but that's where it all stopped. The Millennium Falcon is a very interesting ship because, again, this is back when the Falcon looked like the Rebel Blockade Runner for, I don't know, 80% of the ship. And then the cockpit looked a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit like the Eagle from Space 1999. This is a period where they realized, oh my God, we can't copy that. People are going to be thinking we're, we're, you know, we're cribbing off of uh, Space 1999, so let's get rid of that cockpit. Let's get rid of the whole design, you know, basically what they said. And they went with the Falcon, which is the more traditional circular Falcon we know now. So, but they had this beautiful ship they had built already. And at that point, they said, all right, get rid of the cockpit, keep the rest of the ship, put a different cockpit on it, and that, that will be our, our Rebel Blockade Runner. Well, this little model, this miniature, is the original, original, original Falcon. You know, the long, streamlined-looking one with all the different sections to it and the old, like, like I said, Space 1999-ish kind of cockpit. Great representation of something like that. The last two ships were the hardest to find. I ended up, I think I ended up going on eBay because I just could not find them. And, and from what I kept reading was like, for some reason, nobody can find those. I mean, they're, they're harder to find, which leads me to believe they're probably not going to continue this line, which wouldn't surprise me. One of them is the Star Destroyer. Once again, a Star Destroyer, a different kind of Star Destroyer. I mentioned the other one before, the one they used in Solo. That's one kind of version of it. This one looks more, way, way, way more like the final version of the Star Destroyer. It has the more angular, triangular flat surface. It has a even beefier tower section. I, I, I believe they scaled it down a little bit for the final film. And it also has very prominent guns at the edges, both sides and the tip. Similar to those radar dishes I mentioned earlier, where here they're just more gun looking, small sections that you can kind of say oh there's some kind of gun thing there uh, again this is very further along in the stage of of what the star destroyer looks like it's looking way way more like the final product not exactly there yet but it's kind of almost getting there and the final ship that they put out from the cantwell concept vehicles is the land speeder now wow talk about a ship that looks practically nothing like you know the final product this ship is completely practically circular. It almost looks like a Pac-Man shape because it does have a, an angle in the back where the circle is not complete. It has two fins in the back. It has room for a driver in the front, but it is very circular looking. And it brings me back to that droid fighter we were talking about earlier, where it's like, how did you go from this to that? And to me, that droid fighter looks a lot like this concept for the land speeder it just completely baffles me as to how you go from this to that the color is orange which you could kind of say well maybe they kind of kept the color a little bit even though the land speeder is more in the brown shades than the orange but hey there it is but it's completely different completely different you know a lot of these are metal parts with some plastic attached the more different they look to me the, the more interesting they are because you can kind of see that at, at some point, you know, Lucas is like, yes, that's what I'm thinking about. And then at some point he's saying, no, that is not what I'm thinking about. And, and I'm sure this is one of those. This is one of those pieces that he was like, no, that is not where I want to go. <laughs> yes, you do want an open cockpit kind of uh, sports vehicle looking thing. 
you know, a joyride. But no, that's not the right direction. And to me, it looks, again, it looks a little too Flash Gordon-y for me as far as inspiration. But as I said before, I'm still looking for some of those other ones, especially the original trilogy ones. If I run into some of those episode one Phantom Menace ones, I might pick them up as long as they're reasonably priced, which they're not. They're not going to be reasonably priced. Uh, been looking at them for a while now. They, Those are very expensive. But again, if you happen to be into this particular focus collecting of, of trying to collect actual, not just the art of the conceptual design, but somebody that actually manufactured them, you know, in a 3D medium, that you can actually display them with other things. And, and that's what I have. I have them all displayed. They're out of their package. That was a tough thing to decide also, was whether or not to leave the Colin Cantwell ones out of the package, take them out of the package or not. The other ones that I had already were out of the package because a lot of them, I bought them open. They were loose. Uh, sometimes it's a lot cheaper, obviously, to buy them loose than, than packaged, obviously. But just for consistency's sake, I figured, you know what? I want these open because I want to be able to pick them up and look at them in detail. And I want them all next to each other. So... That's how I have them. I love these ships. I really wish they would continue making some of this kind of... There's, again, just like anything else, it's a rabbit hole. You could fall in a rabbit hole, and, and if they manufacture a lot of these, you, you could fall deep, deep into a rabbit hole. Fortunately and unfortunately, because they're not that popular, they don't make them, I would be surprised if they make more. Cantwell has a couple of more ships in his library, if you will, that they could make, I, I believe. There's a few more. He they, they they could make the Death Star, they could make the Sand Crawler. I would have to kind of research a little more, but he, he does have a couple more that I've seen pictures of that could potentially be made into something. And obviously, with McQuarrie and Joe Johnston and these other artists, it's an endless supply that's out there, if it ever came. So I would strongly recommend you guys uh, taking a look at all of these available concept ships. Okay, for a different kind of collectible that I'd like to go over today, we're still going to remain in the Star Wars theme. We are going to take a look at the Star Wars Movie Viewer. Now, this is something I never owned before. And you, you have to kind of remember, again, every now and then we have to kind of go back to how things used to be before this modern time of basically everything is at your fingertips. You go see a movie in the theater and you might be able to see a, a version of it, quote-unquote version of it, on the internet the same day or a week later. Usually about three or four months later, there's already a home video version, a DVD, a Blu-ray, a 4K, whatever format. And even before that, you might be able to see it on cable television. You might be able to see it pay-per-view, I don't even know if pay-per-view exists, on demand, I think they call it now, uh, or on an airplane, you know, it, the, the turnaround for movies now is just plain ridiculous. There are movies now that are released simultaneously as a uh, on-demand and on the theater at the same time, you know, obviously not the big popular titles, but the turnaround is insane. Back in the 70s and the early 80s, <laughs> just the regular 80s, I would say, there was a big lag between these things. And as we've explained in the past, uh, sometimes with very popular movies, they would re-release them again the following summer, the following spring, the following year, whatever. Before a sequel would come out, movies like Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark, they would re-release the previous film or the previous films to kind of hype everyone up to get ready for the sequel, you know, that kind of thing. But... This, these things took time to really, really experience the movie again as a kid. You know, adults really didn't care if you think about it. And that movie's a movie. You go watch a movie, and then you wait, and then, you you know, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> Eventually, you know, ABC, movie of the week, Jaws, starring Roy Scheider. You know, you get, <laughs> that's the closest thing you, you, you would get to watching them again. This is before the video craze. This is before VCRs, you know. I remember Star Wars, I think it was like, Star Wars came out in 77, but not until like 1982, I think, that it had finally made it to the home video market. So yeah, eventually, you know, these things start to kind of trickle there. They start to find their way, you know, to, to uh, somewhere where you can actually buy them. But in the 70s, you know, you weren't there yet. You know, very few people owned VCRs and... Those who did were super expensive or Betamax, you know, that sort of thing. The closest thing you had to being able to recreate a film with these kind of movies, and I owned a few of these, were the 8mm 
um, prints. Obviously, you could also have 16 millimeter prints, but those were mainly for higher end presentations like a school, let's say, or a, or some kind of um, institution or somewhere that it's a little more professional, a library, maybe, might have a 60 millimeter print, you never know. But uh, schools is really what really, uh, I could kind of picture them uh, being more in that, in that realm, in that format. But for home viewership, you know, not everybody had a 60 millimeter projector. If you were somewhat of a film enthusiast, you might have an eight millimeter because an eight millimeter, you could shoot your own films and then you can play them at home and then you can buy some. Now with the eight millimeter, again, back then, these would come in what they called selected scenes. And for Star Wars or for even Empire Strikes Back, I remember, uh, I owned a reel, a 400 foot reel of Star Wars, which was selected scenes from Star Wars. Uh, it, it, totaled uh, to about maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes worth of, uh, of footage. It, it wasn't that long. It was just quick little clip, you know, little clips. And for Empire, same deal. I had two different reels, reel one and reel two. And yeah, they did spread out in each of those, something like, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes worth of footage on each. And it selected scenes. Keep in mind, um, you know, the aspect ratio is four by, uh, four by, four by three, is it? Three by four. You know, it's the television box uh, format. And we weren't dealing in any kind of widescreen uh, for, 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 for home presentations anyway. But even that was expensive. You know, you to, to be into that sort of thing, it was a little, it was a little too much to expect from your average consumer. So what other ways were there for kids to be able to relive the movie? Obviously, we bought all the toys. We went completely insane with buying the action figures, and you recreate the scenes with your action figures. You have print media. You can read, you know, the, the story in many different ways. You could buy the book. You could, you could buy the comic book. You know, the comic book, at least you have pictures that show you these scenes, and you can kind of, kind of re-put all that together. But back then, you just went again. You just kept going. The, the, the repeat viewership for films obviously popular films was insane because that's when 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 a film would stay in the theater for months and months and months now the shelf life of a film it's if it stays for a whole month it's a blockbuster <laughs> now it's amazing how little these films stay in the you know in the theater compared to back then so what other uh, methods did kids have well again this is something i never owned before this device lets you kind of watch selected scenes for a few seconds, not as much as an eight millimeter reel that, like I said, the one that I used to have. This is a, a very more economical way of doing it. This item is from Kenner, like most of the uh, items that come, you know, initially from Star Wars. The thing to keep in mind about this item is that, and, and we, we, we've told this story before, when Star Wars came out, they were not ready for the onslaught of merchandise that was demanded people wanted to spend money on this stuff and obviously lucas and his his top business people they at a certain point realized there's a lot of money that could be made and, and eventually got made you know from merchandising from toys and that sort of thing licensing so when they finally made their deal with kenner ideally to produce all these toys that they have in mind producing the action figures, the ships, you know, all that stuff. They realized that there was going to be some ramp up time. But in the meantime, they didn't want to waste time. Money was being basically thrown out the window in the meantime. You know, you could pump out a, an album. Yes, an album. You can manufacture an album or, or an 8-track. <laughs> Back then, you could put it in an 8-track or, or a record. You could print a poster. Yes, you could print a poster. You could print a book. Yes, we can print a book. But toy manufacturing is a lot more difficult. So initially... You know, when you have that first gigantic wave of toys that you have in the, you know, in, in, in the pipeline ready to come out, it was going to take them a, a, a quite a bit of time. It was going to take them at least another six months, at least, and then possibly even longer to get that first wave. That's the whole point behind the early bird set that we talked about also in the past. The, the best thing they could do is promise kids these toys while they're still trying to manufacture them. But in the meantime... And Kenner was able to, and this is something, it's not unusual, this has been done many times in the past. Kenner was able to repurpose a lot of their older toys 
to basically give them a new coat of paint and put a fresh sticker on them and put them out there so so people could kind of work at it, have something to chew on until the more original, the better looking stuff. This is the period when you had all those puzzles. The puzzles came out, the puzzles are simple, the puzzles are easy to make, they can kind of turn those around faster. But there was a lot of electronic uh, toys, uh, mechanical toys, that they were able to kind of repurpose from that first wave. And one of them is this particular product, the movie viewer. Now, the movie viewer, from what I understand, had been in the works for quite a while. Uh, I believe it maybe as early as 1977. Um, the first one, I think, that might have come out was a Snoopy-related one. Now, when I'm talking about the movie viewer, you'll see in the little picture, it's, it's almost like a little miniature film camera, let's say. And in it, you slap on a cartridge, and you go to the opposite end of the film camera, and there's a, a viewer, a little viewing uh, viewfinder. You stick your eye in there, and then there's a crank on the side, and you crank it. And that lets you see something inside. Inside that cartridge that is replaceable. You can buy up to four different cartridges, plus the one that comes with the viewer itself. So it's a total of five, really. You do have a color silent strip of film that basically plays on a loop. Uh, now, the total time for this thing is about, I don't know, 30, 40 seconds. So you're not dealing with a lot of film here. It's enough film to fit into these red cartridges. So, like I said, you just watch in the little viewfinder and you crank it. The faster you crank, the faster it moves, the slower, the slower. It does have a little focus ring here in case you need to adjust the focus a little bit. And on top, it has a little translucent tab, which basically is what allows the light to come into this, into the unit so that you can actually give it some brightness inside. Now, what makes this any different than any other one that they manufactured before? As I mentioned before, the first one I think on record might have been the, the uh, Snoopy one. Well, it's basically a Star Wars sticker they put on the side. So depending on what the product they're selling, they'll stick a, a sticker on it, and there it is. There it is. There's your sticker. That means it's officially Star Wars now. The cartridge itself, same thing. They stick a sticker on it, and, you know, the film inside, but the, the mechanism, the package, the, the, the actual item is, is a recyclable item that they can use for any other of their licenses. So, first, uh, like I said, there was a Snoopy one. At one point, there is a $6 million man one. Wow. Same technique. You crank it, a slap on a cartridge, and you can, you know, theoretically uh, replace these cartridges. There is a Bionic Woman one. Okay, well, okay. I, I, I see the theme here. They, they have the license to the Bionic Man. Then Star Wars. And then finally, at one point, they actually even made an Alien one, believe it or not. Again, this is a whole other world. How do you market Alien? And uh, this is something that, that uh, Charles Lippincott talks quite a bit <laughs> on his Facebook page because Alien was such a non-child film and it's so funny because the even the picture on the on the packaging is this little kid who's probably i don't know what like eight or nine years old and he's got his mouth open like he's enjoying the crap out of this thing and he's cranking the wheel and it's like wait a minute this is an r-rated film what's this kid doing <laughs> it's really funny but um going back to the star wars one the star wars ones yes you you, you had your package ones that came with a cartridge already included that particular cartridge is labeled may the force be with you and it gives you kind of a, a sampler, if you will, of, of, of different scenes. And I remember, about 40 seconds long, so you really can't go that crazy with scenes. You got to show maybe about five or six seconds, and then you move on to another scene. There are other cartridges called Destroyed Death Star. I guess that's the, when they sneak into the Death Star. I don't know, maybe. A danger at the Cantina. Okay, maybe a lot of Cantina shots. Battle in Hyperspace. That's a weird one, because... Maybe that's the space battle on their way from the Death Star to Yavin, maybe? I don't know. And Assault on the Death Star. Okay, that's probably the end, the the, the final battle, the trench scene. A lot of these cartridges, but first of all, they're, very, they're, they're, they're kind of expensive. I lucked out through, again, through one of my Facebook groups. Somebody popped the player and the cartridge. And I snatched it up really fast. It wasn't that expensive. It's a lot cheaper than any of the Facebook ones I've seen. This is one of those items that is just a bizarre historical item. You know, it's not the type of thing that I would collect. I wouldn't go around chasing these around. I remember 
not buying a lot of, of this ancillary first wave stuff. First of all, I wasn't here. I wasn't here in 77. I came here, let me think. If I, Again, if I remember right, I came here in 78 for maybe a month. I was on vacation. And that's when I first saw everything. That's when I first bought possibly the first 12 figures, maybe a couple more. I don't remember. But that's definitely when I had them and I brought them back to Uruguay and they were like, everybody, my friends were like, what the hell are these? And they were like, they were really special. (laughs) Nobody had ever seen, I had never seen anything like this before. So when I came back here in 79, now you're talking full tilt craziness. You're talking about ships, you're talking about second waves, third waves, new movies. You know, that's when I just completely lost my mind. But I missed, you know, that's the thing. I missed that first initial pre-action figure wave. I missed the the 77 recycling of old toys waves, the the, the puzzles, the this type of an item. You know, all those older items that um, were kind of cheapy, uh, crappy, if you will, and, and recycled uh, kind of uh, formats from, from Kenner, General Mills, you know, all that kind of stuff. Now, one of the things about this particular item is that uh, when you look through the hole, when you look through the viewfinder, everything has this shade of red. Uh, The film does not look like what I imagine originally it looked like. I'm going to imagine that originally this film stock uh, looked pretty much the colors that it should be. And I'm finding that a lot of the uh, ones that you see now, they're very, very uh, faded and, and just the aging of the film alone. I, I, I mean, unless you keep this in a refrigerator at a certain temperature or something, I, I don't think the film can survive the degradation that you do when films just starts to kind of break apart. You also hear stories of a lot of people that buy these now and the cartridges don't work or you crank a few times and the thing stops working or the, the, the it's out of alignment. They just don't work at all, period. You know, So I think I kind of lucked out that I was able to kind of buy one that actually functions the way it should. Granted, like I said, the colors are completely way off. Now, what I'm going to be able to do here is I'm going to put links, you know, on my show notes like I usually do, because on YouTube, somebody was able to, uh, a few people, I guess, they were able to transfer that footage. <laughs> I guess you could stick a camera lens, a little tiny camera lens into the viewfinder of, of all five different samples of the, the cartridges. So you can kind of see what they look like. You can see that crazy red shading on them that, you know, unfortunately, uh, that's what you get, you know, when, when it's something this old. And what I also found was one person uh, very ingeniously took the the one that I have right now, the, the one that's called May the Force Be With You, which is, again, it's the sampler one that comes with uh, the, the actual device. The device might have been sold with a couple of other ones, or at least they teased the other cartridges. But what they did here is that they took... The structure, you know, the format, the the edit list, if you will, of that first cartridge, and they transferred it and replaced it with actual clips of the movie in a three by four format. So it's your only way to actually experience the colors, if you will, without all the degradation and the scratches and the and the, the, the weird lookingness that you do now when you stick your eye in there to look. Obviously, there's no sound, but he did add the sound of the clicking sound of the crank. So it's it's a cute, weird little thing that was done that I, at first I'm like, wait a minute, is this, what is this supposed to be? And I'm like, oh, I see what they, because you, when you read their notes, it's like, yeah, they recreated the whole thing with actual real clips. So that's a cute little thing, I think, uh, that, that you guys might appreciate is to, to see what this thing actually should look like if you had bought it brand new and looked at it for the first time. The only other item I can think of, and again, I'm not actively looking for it, but I can remember, I, I, I'm pretty sure, I, maybe I'm imagining it, but I'm pretty sure I also had, from around this time, I don't know if it was either Star Wars or Empire, it's like a little toy projector where you can slide these these cards in, these translucent cards, and you can project on the wall a cartoon image of Star Wars or Empire. I'm not, again, I'm not sure which one. And, and you know, maybe one day I'll run into this. But again, you know, again, as, as a child, you're trying to recreate this movie in any conceivable fashion. You buy the cards, you know, you, you align the cards, and it's almost like you have storyboards of, of the movie, and you're like, okay, here's here's the beginning of the movie, and, and here's my action figures, and, and now I have this other thing, and I have... The, you, you, you're trying to reconstruct this whole thing, and it's... 
yeah, I remember those days. I remember those days where you didn't have the option, man. I remember once, um, I think it was around Return of the Jedi, somebody had a bootleg copy of Return of the Jedi. It was the most god-awful thing in the world. You could not make out half the th scenes because this was probably like an 18th generation copy where the tracking would go off. And the, the, the it, it, for those who you remember what tracking was, it was a game changer when, when the video market hit. And now these type of products, they just weren't needed anymore. You, can, you don't have to recreate anything because now it's already there. It's already been done for you. You could just pop it on your VCR and you watch it at home. So it's a combination of these items basically went away for two reasons. The home video market killed the need for any of this type of low level recreation of the film. And number two, the whole purpose of these items was to pump some product out before the real products would come out. So these were really placeholders, if you think about it. They were placeholders for what was to come for all of these action figures that are now, you know, on my wall unit here and my glass cases and, you know, all that stuff that's, you know, that followed. They were just there to kind of keep us calm, you know, with something. Nowadays, you know, when something like this turns up, whether it's on a flea market or an antique mall or on a convention or in a Facebook group, sometimes, you know, depending on the item, when it's rare enough, it's the type of thing that I would be like, yeah, that's something I wouldn't mind owning just for its historical purpose. It's strictly a collecting thing. Obviously, I'm not going to play with it. I don't want to crank this thing too much. It's the type of thing that I would like to show somebody and then just put it back. I'm not going to sit here for three hours cranking this thing <laughs> because there are so many better versions of this thing going around that it's just ridiculous that, you know, that I'm, I'm just shocked. That I'm just plain and simply shocked that this thing actually functions, still functions, because like I said, I've heard so many stories of them just completely breaking down and, and not functioning anymore. As to the rest of the cassettes, if I find them cheap or, uh, again, in a, a flea market or some kind of cheapy kind of scenario, uh, I, I'll pick them up. But again, remember, they're all on YouTube. You can actually physically, you can actually view what the content is. And you, you will be disappointed because of the, the quality of what these things look like now. And it's just incredible, you know, back then when you're forced to rely on your imagination for a lot of this, how much you're willing to put up with, <laughs> you know, but you will find this more and more, especially in the 70s, how many items uh, had been recycled. Uh, and Star Wars is notorious for them. There are so many other electronic games. There's like, I think there's like a shoot 'em up game where you have like a gun and a little like a pinball looking uh, thing and you shoot forward. And that was also a recycled uh, shoot 'em up, uh, I think like a, an Air Force y kind of game or something. And even the early electronic games also recycled. A lot of recycled stuff that they were able to uh, repurpose. Plain and simple, repurpose, you know, and put a sticker up, put a Star Wars sticker on it, and there you go. And it's not the first time this has been happening for a very long time. Star Trek went through a lot of this too, and you know, many of these product lines, uh, they 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 they've had this happen to them. But you know, it's cool. Like I said, if you're you know out there looking for vintage toys and that sort of thing, and your focus happens to be Star Wars, it's really cool sometimes when you find something that first of all you were never interested in the first place, but now you kind of understand you know, its significance, its historical significance in, in the marketing and the, uh, you know, the selling of the Star Wars brand. All right, I hope everybody enjoyed today's show. We started out with our Series Alpha ships. We moved on to the Colin Cantwell concept Hot Wheel ships, the one they did for Solo also, which was kind of like a titanium, uh, Kennery, Hasbro kind of line. You know, how all these different ships were produced finally in a three-dimensional form for us to be able to, you know, hold and look at it in, in a different manner other than just a page of conceptual drawings. Hopefully they'll make some more. I still have a couple that I was not able to find, you know, throughout these years that I'm still hunting for. So, you know, if that is the type of thing you're into, it would be a perfect uh, way to kind of start your collection. And then we jumped over to the uh, Star Wars Movie Viewer, a bizarre little item, you know, so prehistoric in a way and simple and uh you know low at the time low maintenance you know you don't even need batteries to run this thing 
in order to be able to watch these little tiny, tiny selected clips of the film and how uh, nowadays it is such an irrelevant item that you would just never even get anywhere near manufacturing something like that these days. Uh, but back then it was it was the closest thing to home video. There was no home video. Star Wars on home video at the time was almost almost getting there. VHS, uh, VCRs, Betamax, all that stuff was still in its infancy. Uh, super, super expensive. But before we had that, you know, before we had access to stuff like that, this is what they gave us. And it was something that was developed even earlier for other purposes that was then kind of repurposed, recycled, if you will, you know, to get us through the initial merchandising push that was coming because they weren't ready. By 1978, they started pushing and pushing hard with merchandise, original design merchandise, and they were able to kind of step away from these, you know, recycled kind of items from other toy lines that, you know, that Kenner and General Mills had the rights to. But it's nothing new. Stuff like that would happen all the time where, you know, they tried to recycle some toys, you know, to kind of uh, fill in the gap, you know, when, when needed. But it's a great little item. It's a hist As far as I'm concerned, it's a historic item in, into the merchandising and the production of toys, you know, specifically for the Star Wars brand. So thank you guys for listening. We hope to see you again here at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Star Wars, you and your children loved it. Now the Earthlings at Kenner have asked my associate and me to present the Star Wars collection. Truly remarkable toys and games for your children. What are you so excited about now? My goodness, the Star Wars TIE Fighter and X-Wing Fighter. Now your children can relive our great space battles or collect our wonderful Star Wars companions with Kenner's Star Wars action figures. R2, it's a little you. Kenner's new radio-controlled R2-D2 anyone can command. Ah, oh, the Star Wars land speeder that moves like it's floating. And here's Kenner's Death Star space station, four floors of action, a trash compactor too. Listen, R2, that's the Star Wars electronic laser battle, a game of speed, reflex, and reaction. These and other toys and games in Kenner's Star Wars collection are sold separately. Batteries are not included. May the Force be with you and your children. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone, copyright 2019. <laughs>